Hi, welcome. In a minute, we're going to be talking with Lucia Solis. She's an expert in coffee processing and especially custom fermentation. She's a consultant to the coffee industry. She works with farmers and roasters, and I look forward to learning a lot from Lucia during this chat. Um, I'll just wait for her to sign in and uh, we'll get going. During the chat, we have a handful of questions that people submitted already via Instagram, and I will try to cover all of those. There's Lucia. And we're also happy to take live questions as they get texted in. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Hey. Hey, nice to see you. Good to see you too. Can you hear me? Are we good? Yeah, on your end, everything good? Yeah. Okay, do you have do you have animal noises in the background today? Not yet, but okay. now I feel like we've jinxed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kind of looking forward to those. I feel like we could spice it up a little bit. <laughs> so um, I apologize ahead of time. My internet has hesitated a couple of times this morning. Hopefully uh, it'll, it'll be okay now. We talked to the internet company and all that. So. Um, anyway, um, this is Lucia Solis. She's... Uh, uh, she used to work in the wine industry. Now she's working in coffee. She's an expert in fermentation and coffee processing. And she works with uh, producers and roasters. And every time I talk to Lucia, I learn a ton. Um, I am not an expert in processing by any means. So I'll definitely play the role of a uh, person who has a lot of questions for you. Um, but I'd love in your own words to tell, tell us a little bit about what you do and what your perspective is on your work. Definitely. I mean, I think the first place to start is one of one of the things that I'm trying to be a lot more deliberate about is is the word expert. I think that for me, an expert is, is very much a person who is doing original research and is finding out new things that have not been discovered before. And I don't do that. I think a lot of people do <laughs> think I do that. <laughs> and in a way that I, I definitely find new information that people don't have because I do a lot of work in kind of these fringe areas, but I think of myself as a specialist because I work in a commercial setting trying to solve problems. So I'm not an academic. I'm not a researcher. I'm not creating original research. I'm not doing, I, I, I think of myself more as a translator. So I take the work of experts and then I apply it in real life. So I, I think of myself as somebody who takes the, the lab work, takes the, the research, and then I take it to the mill and then we see how it works uh, with all of the challenges that you have when you're not in a lab setting and that you can control all of the environment. So I, the word that I like to use for myself is a specialist. I specialize in coffee fermentation, um, but I really reserve the word expert for people that are doing original research. Um, and in that sense, what I do is I work with private, uh, private clients with coffee producers who are looking to improve their processing practices, and that can involve many different things. Either they've just heard of yeast or they want to try fermentation without yeast or they just have some issues in processing and they want some context, some help. And so most of my job is flying to mills. I like to work mostly uh, live in person at the mm -hmm. mill and I work for, usually my visits are about a week. If it's far, if I'm going to Africa, or if I'm going to Brazil, I try to stay two weeks or just a little bit longer to make the trip worth it because I, I was based in the U.S. And now, currently today, I'm in, in Mexico, and I'll be floating around for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and now, oh, do you hear them? Do you ah. hear the dogs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So just to explain, I'm in Mexico right now, and my Airbnb did not disclose that it is located behind a veterinary clinic. So during the day, <laughs> there's just like a lot of dogs. So I hope it's, I hope it's bearable. No, it's, it's not loud at all. It's actually kind of cute, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, that's, that's where I came from. Okay. Um, and, and like you said, with um, my, my background is I, I haven't been working in the wine industry that long. I really started in 2014. So I only have six years of hands-on coffee processing. But I have another nine years of working with just processing when I used to work in the wine industry. Mm -hmm. So processing, I feel very comfortable with getting a product from point A to point B um, and thinking about how to solve problems and move a product through a facility in the most efficient way. Um, and as well, my degree is from UC Davis in 
viticulture and enology. So that involved a lot of microbiology. Uh, viticulture is grape growing, so it's a lot more plant biology. And then enology is chemistry of winemaking. So my degree was a lot of microbiology, chemistry, um, plant biology, food science, kind of all rolled into one. And I worked on uh, wine industry until I was recruited to work in coffee. So that was in 2014. Okay. Um, tell me, I'm going to jump ahead to my own personal question that, that I, I think is kind of relevant here. When I first heard about you, I was really fascinated about what you're doing. And I thought, wow, this is so exciting. And, and I, I love the idea of applying something you've learned in one field to another field. I think that there's always tremendous uh, things we can learn from other fields. And there were a lot of people who I would say are, are you know, extremely competent at what they do, whether they're coffee importers, whether they're roasters, screen buyers, who were extremely uh, resistant to your work. And um, I, I feel like that resistance has, has faded a bit. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about like, you know, what's, what's your position relative to the industry and, and, and where are people at in terms of accepting what you do? Because, you know, some people I think originally thought like, oh, custom fermentation is gonna make all coffee taste the same or, or, or other, other such thoughts. Um, so, so talk to me about that because I feel like you're winning this, this slow battle of winning hearts and minds and, and you should, you know, um, tell me about that. Wow, um, that's very generous. I wouldn't say the same thing. I feel like I've had the, the, the resistance that I felt six years ago is still pretty strong. So maybe I'm just not talking to the right people. But <laughs> I think that the, the, the biggest thing to understand is, is the context that the way that coffee has been processed in most, I work mostly in Central America. I have worked a little bit in Africa and I have some virtual clients, but the majority of my experience is in Central and South America. And in that place, in those, in those countries, coffee has been processed very similarly for, you know, 80, 100 years. And so anything that is new is, by definition, disruptive. And anything that disrupts, like, a very traditional system is, is scary. And there's going to be a lot of resistance to anything that's new. Sure. My uh, frustration is with the misunderstanding that this, this type of, like, fermentation uh, – manipulation, fermentation, um, you know, attention is new. Like fermentation is the oldest method of food preservation. So sure. this is something that's been happening for a very long time since, since humans have been, you know, trying to figure out how do we make our food last longer. Um, and coffee's sort of been left out of this conversation. And so my perspective has just been really interesting that a lot of my work, I think, is misunderstood, that it's innovative or that I'm trying to push coffee forward. And I really approached it from – you know, we're not having the conversation that coffee's been left behind and that we, that coffee should be able to catch up to other industries like wine or beer or sake or sauerkraut or <laughs> yogurt or cheese yeah. or, you know, all of our other uh, sourdough, all of our other fermented foods. And so I think, you know, the, the focus has been um, to the detriment of kind of the advancement of coffee has just been like, we've been so focused on like, this is new and scary and we haven't focused on, like, why did it take so long to get here? Why has coffee not been part of this? So I think that that – I still feel that resistance very strongly. Like you said, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what yeast can do um, and sort of the aim of yeast. And the conversation is really focused around homogeneity and, you know, yeah. flavors and getting a particular flavor profile and, like, tricking – certain, you know, origins to taste like other ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because those are, for me, really boring questions. Like, there's bigger, more interesting questions. And, like, <laughs> that's where a lot of the, the conversation is. But um, as you've, you know, you've helped me uh, kind of have some patience in that this is the groundwork that hasn't happened yet. So someone's <clears> got to have these conversations. We've got to lay these things, and maybe eventually we'll get to, to somewhere yeah. else. I see it. It's, it's always, for me, it's like a five-year process from a – a new idea or a new push to, to broader acceptance. It's like you always get first the resistance, then the grudging, I'll try it. And then the whole like, Oh, I've always been that way. I've always agreed you know, and it just, it just takes that five or six years sometimes I think. Um, so my, my limited understanding of using yeast in the fermentation of coffee is that when done uh, intentionally rather than just, just wildly uh, with say certain strains of yeast that you, you can get more predictable results, which is, which is great for decreasing risk for farmers. 
And also you, you may have the potential of uh, decreasing the rate at which coffee will fade or, or age. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, I want to know the, you know, the back of the napkin version of like, why should I care about yeast fermentation in coffee? Like what's so, what's so good about it? Oh, you may have come to the wrong place. I can't do back of the napkin anything. That's why I had to get off Instagram and start the podcast. I'm like, I, I can't do this in a post. I need to talk about it for three hours. <laughs> um, but I'll try. So I think the first thing to understand is that we, we're lumping two things that are not necessarily related. So we have fermentation, like coffee fermentation, and then you have cultured yeast inoculation. Okay. And coffee fermentation, without... Uh, like a commercial inoculation of yeast, you can still uh, manipulate the environment. You can still reduce the amount of oxygen. You can change the temperature. Sure. You can add other fruit. You can do other things that would change the microbes in the tank, and you would still have a yeast-dominated fermentation that is um, wild, that is just whatever is local, the local uh, microbe there. And that fermentation in and of itself will have benefits towards the what we've talked about, like homogeneity and roasting and longer shelf life. Separate but sort of related is using commercial yeast, using a different um, yeast strain like a champagne or a beer or even a sourdough uh, yeast that you can add into your fermentation tank. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people just think that if we're talking about coffee fermentations, we're automatically talking about cultured yeast added fermentation. Um, and I think that's part of the nomenclature that's missing is we talk about yeast added and then we assume that any other fermentation doesn't have yeast added. Like right, right. you create its opposite of like no yeast added versus yeast added, whereas yeah. all fermentations have yeast present. It's very right. difficult to, you would have to pulp your coffee, sanitize it with, I don't know, uh, sulfur dioxide or something, <laughs> kill everything, yeah. Yeah. only add bacteria. Like it'd be a really difficult process. Right. So, one thing sort of moving forward is having the assumption that your fermentation has yeast in it. Whether you added some or not, it's there. Right. So how, how does this have this like magical ability to have shelf life? I think this is also something that can be a little bit confusing to understand because when we think of shelf life, we think of preserving. So you could think about the way we preserve food now is like putting it in the refrigerator or freezing it where you're lowering the temperature and you are reducing the rate of reaction. So instead of something happening at room temperature, if it's colder, the same reaction will happen much more slowly and you can gain time that way. Mm -hmm. Well, yeast, these types of fermentations, uh, like I want to say like intentional extended fermentations, mm -hmm. uh, these work to in increase shelf life, not by preserving necessarily, sure. but by creating more starting material. So if we think about fade or decomposition as you know you have a certain amount of like a pile of legos and time oxidation is like taking those legos yeah. away and eventually you have you know almost nothing something very empty having a fermentation is like you just get to start with a giant pile of legos now you get like a dump truck of legos and you still have the same uh oxidation reactions you're still losing material over time but if you start out with a truckload then you can decompose for much longer than if you have a really tiny pile, like you'll notice it more quickly. Sure. So this preservation method or increasing shelf life is like, if you just start out with more stuff, then <laughs> your yeah. stuff is going to last longer. Right. And, and then the confusion is like, well, how, do, how does yeast make stuff? How does yeast create these compounds that are in our coffee? Yeah. Um, and the yeast create that through the fermentation. So I think another thing that, a leap that is not that's really difficult to make if you've never studied microbiology is that the yeast the fermentation is the way that yeast get energy it's the way that they survive and so and bacteria as well we'll talk about both yeast and bacteria and so they consume sugar break down the sugar and in that process get energy for themselves and then there's always byproducts of a reaction and it's just lucky that we like those byproducts so like <laughs> right. the yeast burps and yeast farts and like yeast all of those byproducts of the yeast metabolism are these like really fruity flavorful interesting compounds to to consumers sure. and so these um the yeast are able to make polysaccharides so we can have a coffee that is polysaccharides are heavier weighted molecules so in the mouthfeel they it can feel like you have a heavier coffee um, they also create thiols and esters, and that's where you get those 
really floral or, or fruity compounds. Um, they can also change the pH so we can get more acidity. So the things that you can mess with are body acidity and then fruity flavors. Um, sugar is one of the it's one of those things where people are like, well, I, I want my coffee to be sweeter. Almost yeah. everybody wants sweeter coffee. Sure. But to try to accomplish that with fermentation is um, it doesn't make sense because the way that fermentation works is breaking down sugar. So you sure. can't get more sweetness and more sugar if the mechanism is to always be reducing sugar. Mm. So then people are afraid because they think, well, if I ferment too long, then I'm going to deplete all of my sweetness. I'm going to deplete all of my sugar. But if you've tasted specialty coffees, you know that doesn't actually happen. You can have a coffee that has been fermented for 40 hours, 100 hours, that still has a sweetness component to it because we can kind of trick our minds. Like sugar isn't the only way to get sweetness. If you have a coffee that has a lot of body and a syrupy and has a flavor of like strawberries and honey, then your mind can just fill in the blank and say, oh, it's sweet because I have the body and then I have the flavor and there doesn't have to be any sugar right. available or um, still there. Right. I think that's a classic misconception. I mean, no matter how sweet we think the coffee is, there's actually very little sugar in the coffee. It's probably yeah. more about the balance of flavors and how much sourness and bitterness are competing with the carbohydrate, et cetera, to produce what we think of as sweet, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Um, so... <laughs> I don't Go know where I was going. Okay. Uh, so you did a great job, and, and that was a very big um, napkin, but it was excellent, really. Like, and, you, and you have fans. Every, everyone's comment is like, that was really well articulated. Everyone likes the Lego comment. I do, too. Um, so so to, to interpret what you're saying, coffee beans, coffee seeds have nutrients in them. And <clears throat> over time, coffee fade, I, if I'm not mistaken, is related to essentially the seed is kind of eating itself. Like it's it's metabolizing its own nutrients to survive in a sense. And that's what causes coffee fade. And in a sense, your yeast handled properly with, with the skillful fermentation may allow you to start with more Lego, more nutrients. And so you're just always ahead of the curve in terms of how, how good it's going to taste at any given point in time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Actually, there's something I really want to say about this. We talk about coffee fermentation, and again, we really look at coffee as like one thing, like a coffee seed or a coffee bean or a coffee cherry as like one unit. Um, and I think that this really goes to what you were saying earlier, where there's like the pendulum, like we ignore something and then we give it like a lot of attention and then we have to like yes. pull back a little bit. Um, so I think previously the pendulum was in efficiency and volume for coffee production. Sure. 40, 50 years ago. We just wanted to get the coffee and the, the value add came in the roasting in like a particular style and you could sort of get coffee from anywhere and that's why it was a commodity. Whoever had the cheapest coffee, I'm going to buy it from Peru, I'm going to buy it from Honduras, I'm going to roast it my way and that's how you give it to consumers. And then with the advent of, of noticing or caring where the, the origin was, like where does this coffee being produced, where is it coming from, there was now this interest of like, oh, coffee from different places tastes differently. And is it just because of the country or is it because of the cultural practices of how that coffee is produced there? And then we've started to like build a little bit more information. And so coffee was completely anonymous and kind of ambiguous. And now we have processing and now we have uh, region differences. And then we got fermentation. And then with fermentation, it's like we really like didn't know this existed. <laughs> and so like we weren't talking about it at all and now it's like all coffee all the time is fermented and I kind of helped with that like I didn't give enough context for that so then everyone was like all coffee's fermented and now coffee's like an important fermented food <laughs> and now I've had to pull back and say well not really like it's not the fermentation in coffee is not as necessary um, as it is in the other products that it's commonly like lumped into so for example with wine I'm sorry that's poor. <laughs> with wine moving on uh or cheese uh or sourdough or sake um those grapes will never become wine if there is no fermentation sure, sure. ever <laughs> there's nothing right. you can do <laughs> with coffee that coffee seed if you ferment it it will be coffee if you don't ferment it it will still be coffee so it's not a necessary step. It's a very ubiquitous step. Almost all coffee has some level of fermentation, regardless of, of where you are. I think the other misconception is only washed coffees are fermented, but uh, honeys, pulp naturals, and dry processed natural coffees are also undergoing a fermentation. So fermentation isn't just what happens in the tank. 
it's the microbes that are present all the time. Okay. So the, the concept was that this fermentation could, was happening more than we thought, but it's still not totally necessary. It's something that we can completely skip. And that's why it's like, yes, we need to pay more attention to it, but it's not the, as important as everybody thinks that it is. Totally. So just sort of having that context, context of like, yeah, fermentation is great and it's important, but it's not absolutely necessary. So when we think of like the fermentation of the product, the seed itself doesn't ferment. Um, and this is a huge problem <laughs> with <laughs> carbonic sense. maceration because carbonic maceration, when it comes to grapes, like grapes are this big and there's like a tiny little seed and most of that is pulp and juice that gets um, fermented into, into wine. And coffee is like this much seed and like this much skin. <laughs> And so when we're talking about carbonic maceration in wine, there is an intracellular fermentation because there's so much space between the tiny seed and the giant grape. Sure. But in coffee, that intracellular fermentation is happening within like three millimeters of, of pulp and skin. It's a very, very small fermentation. Um, the seed itself, the inside of the seed doesn't change. That, that, that fermentation doesn't penetrate inside the seed. So all of the fermentation happens on the outside, and then you have to have enough time for those compounds on the outside to kind of permeate into the seed. So I think when we think of fermentation, like there's, um, like in wine, yes, you ferment the grape juice and you drink the grape juice. In coffee, we ferment the outside of the cherry, we have to wait for it to get in, and then you still have to process, like dry, roast, <laughs> grind and brew and then you have your your beverage sure. so there's so many more steps so in a way it's like I've been trying to bring awareness and say like this is important we should talk about it and then it's like oh it's not as important as you think like let's bring it back <laughs> like right. there's way more things to talk about like drying right and then tomorrow there'll be a message on my Instagram that says Lucia Sola says fermentation is not important <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you'll never you'll never yeah. win that one <laughs> no um how about we tackle a few questions um, there's some broad ones and some really specific ones. Um, one that uh, Gold Mountain Coffee just texted in is pretty pretty broad. I think it just it just and I think this I think this is uh, I'll shut up. Um, it says how how can we bring out the most fruitiness through fermentation? Um. Yeah, like that's that's tough for me because I'm like that's not the biggest problem that I think coffee faces. So it's like right. hard to say like, let's solve this or let's answer this. Right. But the answer to that is just be selection choice. Um, so there are different yeasts that are uh, better equipped to make fruity flavors. So if we think about dog breeds and you say, I want to have a guard dog. I want something to patrol my house and right. I want to feel safe and I want secure. Then you wouldn't go get a poodle or a chihuahua <laughs> to be your guard dog. But someone's like, oh, dogs guard your house. That's what you do. And I think that happens really often uh, in, in yeast where people want a fruity coffee and they just get a yeast. And it's not well matched to the job that that yeast is supposed to do. Um, so, for example, choosing like a champagne yeast um, or beer, like yeast are incredibly different. Not even yeah. like even dog breeds are a very poor analogy for how different they are. Right, right, right. Um, so I think that and champagne yeast also came up. And so this is something that I really like to talk about because it's a really misunderstood uh, application. So, like, champagne is great. I love champagne. I love bubbles. Champagne, has it, they can be really fruity. There's a lot of complexity. The yeast in champagne is really important. However, um, what a lot of people don't know is how champagne is made. So champagne, the traditional method in France, I'm not talking about even yeah. some sparkling wines in California or cava or prosecco. I'm talking about champagne in champagne, France, is... The grapes are picked much, much earlier than a red wine or a white wine. So we get, if your typical red wine is picked at like 24, 25 bricks, high sugar, a champagne will be like 19, um, which doesn't sound like a lot less, but it's significantly less sweet um, when, when you're tasting them. So you have a lot less sugar, but really high acid. Mm. These, <laughs> these grapes have a ton of acid. Um, and this is really important. You want that like really acidic component because you're going to have your initial fermentation and then you're going to have your second fermentation in the bottle. And that's why that's how you get the pressure and the carbon dioxide and you get your wonderful champagne. 
So the yeast that needs to ferment the first stage, the champagne yeast, it's basically like a bulldog, like a tank. Like it is the most inelegant type of yeast because the conditions are so hostile. Like mm. for, for you, for a yeast to be able to stand up to that level of acidity, that low sugar, um, slightly lower nutrients, and to be able to have the longevity of having a very extended fermentation, long aging, and then that second fermentation, you want a tank. So those yeasts are very neutral. They're very tough. And they, it's amazing how over time they do end up creating these wines that are delicate and fruity and whatever. But the yeast itself is like a brute. So to use a champagne yeast, and it's not going to happen. And I think I lost you for a second. Oh, I'm still here. Still here. Maybe can okay. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I think the video cuts out a little, but the audio has been fine. Okay. So I think that's one thing that, like, I really think champagne yeast, like, you can use them. Like, that's fine. But there's so much better options, um, and it's not doing what you think it's going to do. So you're not going to get a lot of those flavors, uh, like, that fruity champagne flavor from a champagne yeast. It's a brute. <laughs> So I generally discourage people from using those unless they have incredibly difficult conditions. Right. So if you have, um, and so that's like a match that I would have with, um, with my client, and I would look at, yeah, kind of their nutrition, sort of the conditions, like where the water comes from, and say, okay, we could try a champagne yeast because champagne yeasts are tough. Yeah. But they're not going to be delicate. Right. Is, I, and this might be a tough question to answer because people might <clears throat> might take it too far, but... Can you give an example of a situation that you're in where there was a certain coffee, certain conditions, and, and you could explain that you chose a certain strain of yeast and why you chose it? Like, especially if, if it's to, say, enhance the fruitiness like this person is asking. Well, the kind of the opposite, <laughs> the okay. opposite of that, like, where, where I used a, a yeast like this, this, this champagne yeast, was I had a client in the mountains of Guatemala, and he was very high altitude. It was very cold. And he, he was located between like two mountains. So like his sunlight was very mm. limited. Um, yeah. So he had very little heat. Um, and his water was also very cold. So his fermentations were, you know, going on 80 hours. And the coffee was great. You know, it scored like a 85, 86. He had a long term contract. Um, but he was using a lot of water because it was so cold. The fermentation would take a really long time. And then when they would wash the coffee, the coldness of the mountain water would, like, congeal the mucilage back on. And they'd use, like, double, triple the amount of water, like, really trying to get the coffee clean. And so it wasn't it, it wasn't he was trying to improve his coffee. He was just like, this process is difficult for me. Yeah, and no. so we went and used this, like, brute of a champagne yeast to cut that fermentation down to – like 30 hours so it went from like 80 to 30 and didn't change the flavor we were able to maintain mm. his 86 86 uh, 85 86 score and he was able to use a third as much water because the yeast was able to remove the mucilage so efficiently and so you mm -hmm. need it so that was a situation where i matched the yeast to like not change the coffee but just make the producer's life better and use less resources and so at that point like he doesn't need his coffee to cup you know, 88 and maybe like get charged more because he already had a long term contract, but he still can save money by not using as much water, not having as many people. And then maybe he could process more coffee because his tank is now 30 hours and he can turn it over instead of waiting 80 hours. Yeah. So I really look at the conditions of I really don't try. I try not to design for flavor. I try to design for the circumstance and say, like, what do we have in this mill where maybe they don't have very much water? So how can we design a process that uses less water or potentially they could have a ton of water. Some people like a lot of people don't have that problem, in Central right, America, right, right. <laughs> but they don't have labor. They don't have enough people that consistently are coming to move the coffee. Um, and sometimes coffees don't get washed because people didn't show up. So I try to create a process that can be more of a buffer, be a little bit foolproof so that if your team doesn't show up and it takes like another 12 hours, the coffee's going to be okay. So um, I want to I plug you here for a second. I know that's not what you came here for. But um, in my own experience with consulting, people often don't know what it is that I do or what I can do for them. They make an assumption like, oh, that, that, I would only hire that person to get this result. But I think, I think what you just said about champagne yeast in this guy's particular situation is really important at that. 
I think some people should maybe be open-minded and contact you and just have a conversation about what you do because what you do isn't necessarily always about manipulating flavor. It's not always about using an exact procedure on everyone. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Sometimes you're just improving efficiency. Sometimes you're helping them save money. Sometimes you're helping them harness what they have much better. And, and I think that that's probably part of what people don't understand about what a consultant like you with your, I won't say expertise, but skill um, can, can do. I, I appreciate that. And I think that is a big misconception about my work is that I really don't want to make 86 coffee be 89. Like, I don't want any of those clients. It's like, if that's what you're looking for, I'm not your person. Um, Cause I don't think that's going to move coffee forward. Like some people are doing that and that's great. Right. Right, but right. like for me, my, my preference is really like, I want to work with the 78s, the 77 point coffees and make those like a stable 83, 84. Right. Like I just want to get that hump. I want to work on like 80% of the coffee um, to just be a little bit better and more stable and then sure. move on. Like, yeah. I really don't, um, I think another misconception, cause I am a fermentation designer cause I do design fermentations. I, I mean, I made that name up and I gave it to myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I design fermentation, but I think then the like fill in the blank, the assumption is that I design really crazy for like protocols right, cause, right. cause there are more involved protocols that are like very interesting, but I don't find those interesting. I think that like having very extended protocols and having like all of these um, multi-step or multi-fermentation or sequential, for me, that really feels, um, again, like that's not where I want to make an impact in coffee. And so my goal is when I visit a client, I almost want to feel like I didn't really make an impact. I just like sort of left right. things the same and just made their life a little bit easier because I think totally. it's much easier for them to, you know, gain something by having a more efficient process or using half as many resources than it is to like try and find a buyer who's willing to pay them more for some, you know, arbitrary metric. Yes. Yes. There are, there are many ways to win in my mind when it comes to these things, you know? Yeah. Um, awesome. Um, okay. I'm going to throw a question at you from Normanito. Norman is a friend of mine in, in Holland. He's a green buyer. He's been around for a long time. Um, and I've had this question in my mind too. What is or was semi-washed coffee in your opinion? Does it still exist or have pulp natural and honey and its derivative messages, me methods uh, taken over from, from that? I think this is really tough because, yeah. well, it's tough because like our nomenclature is very poor in coffee. Uh, we're lacking a lot of common vocabulary and that's partially because it's just so global and there's so many countries and so many yeah. languages and so many dialects and like very little information sharing. So a lot of the problems that we have, I think are language problems and cultural. But um, so in this, in this question of like my, my opinion about, you know, semi-washed, this isn't my opinion. This is like the, the, <laughs> the literature right. that I've read um, is that different countries call the same process, different things. Mm -hmm. So you know, what, what may be, and, and that's because the original purpose of fermentation was to be able to dry the coffee as quickly as possible. Hmm. So I think we have not acknowledged that fermentation has been a thing, like for the history of coffee processing uh, in Central America and South America, at least. I can't speak to the history in, in Asia or India um, or Indonesia, but at least in Central America where I work, the purpose of fermentation is like, it needs to be as short as possible. It needs to not exist. We need to get over, like this is a barrier to quality. So we need to like ignore it and then just move on and dry the coffee as quickly as possible. Mm. And so the message that has been hammered into producers has been, this is a danger zone, get out of it as quickly as possible. And then 15 years ago, 10 years ago, like now the message is like, oh no, we want it to be longer. And I think a lot of consumers think that quietly in the background producers have been like mastering their craft and like knowing how to do this and we just like suddenly got a peek into the window of like oh this is what they've been doing and they're really good at it and now we're just going to ask them to like tweak it and get better without understanding that like they have they've this is like whiplash for most producers like they have been told <laughs> yes. do not do this and now we're like do it for a hundred hours and they're like, well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> totally. And so there's a lot of the blind leading the blind where producers are like, we've never been asked for this. So we don't know how to do this. And consumers or buyers are like, we want this now, uh, but we don't know how to do it because we don't know how to process coffee. And so 
there is this um, mutual ambiguity, mutual confusion, mm -hmm. and that's not helped by the traditional processes where we didn't even get that right, right? So there's still confusion between semi-washed and pulp natural, and now we're building on this, like, super shaky foundation, and we want to, like, be really strict with our terms and use these scientific terms, and I'm like, the foundation is messed up. <laughs> like, this is... So the fact that this understanding is so poor. Um, so all that to say that dry process, I like to call it dry process versus natural, because uh, I feel like natural has kind of like a, a value judgment to mm. it, <laughs> like natural yeah. versus unnatural. Yeah. Um, so when, when I say dry process, I mean natural uh, coffee, where it is dried with its skin on, washed. And I think this is another misconception. People are like, what's the difference between washed and wet? wet process and wash coffee and they think that it has to do with water and so they just use them interchangeably wet means wash that is completely incorrect <laughs> those two things are very different wet process is just the opposite of dry meaning it just had its uh it the skin was removed so you can have a wet process coffee that has never seen water so that would just be <laughs> like <Right>. a honey <laughs> right. It, right. It, it, the skin was removed and then it went straight to drying washed was when you take that extra step and either have the fermentation in a tank and then do a, a final rinse before you go to drying. So in some ways, we're like collapsing words where washed and wet are used interchangeably and that's incorrect. And in other ways, we are expanding where we have semi-washed and pulp natural and we think these are different processes, but they really refer to the same thing. So a honey meant that it was, the coffee has been dried with its mucilage still on and a semi-washed is what, what other people in other countries call a pulp natural because it was kind of both, meaning we took the, we, we washed, we did a wet process because we took the skin off, but then we didn't fully wash it. So it's sort of the middle of the line. So again, like in some places, these things mean the same thing and we think they're different. And in other places, we think they're different and we collapse them. So like this needs to be a much bigger, you know, uh, project <laughs> to say like when words have been collapsed and when they've been uh, un, or sort of confusingly like yeah. expanded. So for me, semi-washed and pulp and honey and pulp natural, those three refer to the same thing. It just depends what country you're in, whether you're in Brazil, whether you're in Costa Rica, uh, whether you're in Guatemala. Sure. Okay. Awesome. Um, it's Toby asked two questions. Uh, one, he, he, I, su I assume it's a he, sorry. Um, I was curious if you want to bust any myths, which I think you, you've already been doing all along, and also wondering if you could report about the effect of yeast uh, with Caffea canifora as opposed to Arabica. I don't know if you have experience with that or not. I do. I think this is like a super um, missed opportunity for yeast. I don't, I don't think – so my, my personal experience in my work is that I've seen in Arabica uh, yeast make a difference about six points. Wow. which wow. can be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, but those six points were going from a coffee that was 78 to an 84. That's extraordinary. So this, I, we, we were like shocked um, that, that this happened. Um, but it doesn't hold true all the time. So you can't take an 86 and then just make it an 82 by using this. Piece. <laughs> it's it's part, partially because the, the floor was so low that we were able to, to get up there. Mm -hmm. um, as, in my experience, as you get higher, as you get to 86s, 87s, it's really hard to go up in points just using yeast and just using protocol. At that point, it's more uh, farming and other, like, farm practices and not really what you're doing in the tank. But if it's below that, there's a lot of opportunity. So that's sort of the threshold of, of um, using yeast. With uh, Robusta or Canifora, those changes have been more like 20 points. Like, Whoa. that is a very reliable, like, cupping. <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I know this because of the yeast manufacturer, um, Lalamont, was very interested in doing this. So Lalamont uh, is a company that creates the Lal Cafe series, and those are yeast specifically for coffee. So those are not wine yeast used for coffee or beer used for coffee. They're designed for coffee and coffee conditions. Um, so they've been doing these studies. And we can see those, like, 20 points. The problem is that because it's so low, it's still like, you know, from a 50 to a 70. Yeah, now, it's yeah. still 20 points, but it's still not in the realm of Arabica. And I think it's a little bit of the, like, 
you know, uh, chicken and egg. It's like because there's not as much interest, there's not as yeah. much research, and there's not as much research, so people aren't that interested in it. So I want to get the word out there that, that there is, a, I think, way more opportunity um, outside of Robusta, I'm sorry, outside of Arabica, and that people are starting to do it. I've seen a lot more in Brazil, specialty Robusta. And I think it's not going to be like a preference thing of like, I think that as consumers, we're going to have to face the reality of climate change a lot more quickly than we think and maybe learn to adapt our taste to what is able to be grown. <laughs> like, I don't think we can be so um, so picky in the next decades that are coming. Well, this is if you believe in climate change, of course. You know. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it's sad. Like that. that's, that's still part of the, the discussion. It's so it's horrifying. Um, okay. Oh, I have one thing about beer yeah. yeast. Um, that is a very popular choice. I don't love it. Um, I actually discourage um, my clients and anybody who asks me uh, for my opinion. I really uh, discourage using beer yeast. They're very widely available. They're very easy to use. But if you think about the purpose of, so wine yeast are much better than beer yeast because grapes are fruit and coffee is a fruit. So we have the same like starting material. You have sucrose which is a fructose and a glucose. Um, that's the sugar that is preferred by those, those yeasts, and that's what's found there. When we're talking about beer, um, you're looking at grains. You're fermenting grains. So it's a much different sugar. You're still fermenting sugars, but you're usually fermenting maltose. And maltose is two glucose molecules put together. So you'll still get a fermentation. like It works. But fruit is sucrose, so you have a fructose and a glucose. So that means when you're using a beer yeast, you're only fermenting half of your sugars. You're leaving oh. the fructose completely untouched. Hmm. So for me, that's just like leaving money on the table. It's like yeah. you can do it, but like there are yeasts that will ferment all of those sugars and get you all of those flavors. So why would you only look at half? Right. Um, the other issue is because it's not such a great match because coffee's a fruit and beer yeasts are not meant to ferment fruits. Mm -hmm. The conditions can be really difficult. So if there's not enough nitrogen, um, if the oxygen levels are a little bit off, the yeast get very stressed. And when, when yeast are stressed, they, like us, when we're stressed, we sweat and we have very negative aromas associated with our sweat <laughs> and our stress. And yeast are very similar. Like when yeast get stressed, they produce uh, off odors that are very similar to like onion uh, or BO. Like they can get sweaty. Mm -hmm. And so... A lot of the times when I've tried coffees that have been fermented with beer yeast, I, I'm used to that. I know that. And so, like, to me, it smells like BO. I'm like, these yeasts were very unhappy. <laughs> like, this, is, right. this bums me out. Sometimes it can be, it can come across as, like, cheesy. So I've had some coffees that have, like, a very, like, goat cheese or mm. kind of, and some people love them. Like, right. Right. that's the thing. Like, it's fine. Like, if you find your market, like, congratulations. That's really cool. Right. Um, but if you're not looking for that profile, it's really easy to like dip into that territory of cheesy, funky bo when there's just like <laughs> an easier alternative. <laughs> like it just the wine yeast. Like, I feel like any wine yeast is better than like the best beer yeast. Unless you like your coffee to taste like bo, that's that's, unless the, you, that's the message. <laughs> unless you like the cheesy component, which is a thing, right? right? Like right. in Nordic countries, they put cheese in their coffee. Oh, and, like wow. that's milk and. And I'm trying to remember if it was Norway or somewhere like that. Like, I saw this article where they put, like, it's a cultural thing. They put cheese in their coffee. And oh. you have, like, it's like the extension of, like, putting milk in your coffee. Like, thick proteins that right. will bind the bitterness and just give right. you that. Right. So, like, it's, like, the it's, egg whites in the coffee and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, just knowing that not all yeasts are created equal. It's not like I could use yeast from beer or, or wine, but that they're very different and that you should be aware of what choice you may, what results you may get. I, I feel like you're the spokeswoman for the yeast of the world. I feel like, you know, you're like, all yeast are different. All, all yeast are, <laughs> have their use and don't stress the yeast. <laughs> I'm a yeast advocate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeast, right. Oh. All right. So this is a long one. Uh, Jesse Sweden. Gal Sorry, someone just said Sweden puts cheese ah, in their coffee. Okay. Well, I also remember when I was a teenager, I went to the Nordic countries and, and Finland was putting tuna fish on the pizza unless you told them not to. And I just thought, these people don't know what they're doing. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Italians would go crazy. <laughs> um, 
God bless the Nordics, though. Um, when we talk about fermentation of coffee, it often seems like a designer coffee. In other words, that's like what they're hearing about. Um, is there a concern that fermentation above simply the level needed for processing coffee could be a trend that forces producers to invest in expensive processes and equipment that leaves them in a worse position long term? How can a producer balance creating a coffee that's trendy today uh, and ensuring that they build long term success? Um, okay, I'll stop there and, and see yeah, that's a huge question. I, yeah. I feel like that's, that's a conversation that needs a lot more attention and like mm -hmm. a lot more voices and a lot more input. Um, but my perspective on this is, in my experience, yes, I do see that in a way, unfortunately, fermentation, the way that the specialty coffee industry is talking about it is, is doing more harm than good for producers in that they have even more pressure to create a differentiated product. So like, their coffee, for most producers of the world, have not been paid the cost of production on their coffee. And now we're like, we're going to solve this by asking them to do more right. and raising the bar higher and buy more stuff. And then you can, like, dig yourself out of this poverty. And so I just think that's a really ridiculous way to think that we're going to make progress. It's like, it's a thing with, like, it's been wrong, so let's just, like, double down and do it harder and more. And, like, that's why it hasn't worked. It's because you haven't done it enough. Um, so I've seen it be really detrimental, and I've, I've really thought about, oh, I might be contributing to making it worse because I do want to talk about yeast and I do want to popularize fermentation, but my information gets um, misconstrued a lot and, yeah. and can be used to push producers to say, like, do this or try this yeast or, or you know, create this, this particular process. And so I think that, yes, it's doing more harm than good. I'm thinking about my language and how I'm communicating because I do think that I'm not, I may not be making it worse, but I'm not making it better enough that, that I feel good about. Um, and the question about like, so how do producers walk this fine line of making something that's trendy, but not detrimental to them. And I haven't seen that it's possible. I think it's very few producers that are already very wealthy and have a lot mm. of resources, meaning a lot of connections that can get away with it, that can create something that is what the market wants right now, whether it's an anaerobic or a lactic process or a carbonic maceration, and profit from it because they have those channels. For the regular, like the more typical producer that, that don't have those channels, I don't think it's possible. Um, and that's why I really, when I work with clients, even though the clients that can't afford to hire me are already, you know, have decent means to hire me to come down to their mill, even to them, I really recommend not to do anything trendy because I think that by definition, <laughs> something trendy is unsustainable. Something right. trendy is going to right. be um, not a great place to put your resources. So I don't think it's possible, and I think that's part of what roasters can do is, is sort of realize that our, the whims are consumers, like me too, as, as I drink coffee, I buy coffee, um, that our whims have a lot more repercussions than just like our preferences because um, mm -hmm. it's not an even playing field. So – my favorite way to work with producers, like I mentioned, is to almost have that have the, the feeling that I wasn't there. Like I just sort of came in, like I really like to work behind the scenes. I don't like to like paint a layer of flavor over coffee. Right. I just want to like come in, make things better, and then like <laughs> retreat. Right, right. And I think that painting a layer of flavor over the coffee is the thought that entered the minds of a lot of those people who originally were, were skeptical of your work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that paradigm was like, oh, my God, she's going to coat all the flavors. so They all taste this way. And, and that's really not what you do. You know, you know, it's not what I do. And that is a misconception. But I, even if it was, even if that was like my intention, I still feel like it's not. I don't think it, it should be in the purview of consumers to tell producers what to do right. and to say, like, that's not OK, because there's this like, huge double standard where like we can have, you know, as consumers, we can put milks and alternative milks and syrups and <laughs> um, sugar and all these kind of things in our coffee. But if a producer wants to create a type of um, creamy flavor or caramel or something like in the tank, then that scene is like cheating or it's like tricking us. And we're like, no, we want pure coffee. So it's like we can, we consumers can adulterate it any way that we want, but you can't. And so even just acknowledging that like producers have been put in the situation where they don't have as much freedom to, make coffee whatever flavor they want 
Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. So like that's not what I do, but even if it was, I still feel like it shouldn't have been such a such a resistance to it. Right, right. And and let's face it, practically speaking, there's zero chance that doing something like that would cause like the vast majority of the world's coffee to taste the same. Like really what would happen is just like with all the crazy processes like carbonic maceration that are going on, there'd be some tiny sliver of the market that would go for that kind of coffee and a tiny sliver of the market producing that kind of coffee. And it would just be a, one option on, on the world's menu of coffees. You know, there's no, there's think, no risk. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I, and even if, again, like let's say coffee did become a little bit more uniform, like mm-hmm. hypothetically, um, a little bit more uniform and a little bit more homogenized. There are so many consumers in the world. Like, I really don't think that that is so, Yeah. I don't think that's so wrong to have more consistency in coffee. I think that's been part of the reason why we've been able to pay so little for it um, because you can punish it and be like, well, this coffee isn't very good, so I'm not going to pay that much for it, regardless of what it costs to produce it. So if all coffee, if we just like raise the floor a little bit higher, right. I don't think that would be bad. Or that just the position of saying like, I, as a consumer, may not have as much choice in, like, I'm not going to have 75 coffees to choose from as a consumer, but so many people have much more of a livelihood. Like, I don't think your preference matters that much. Like, I just feel like we're talking about the wrong thing. It's like, so what? Yeah, yeah. But usually people just would do better off stepping back and seeing the big picture and saying, oh, okay, I get it now that it's... Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of what you do is potentially creating great value for producers um, and, you know, that's that's, I think, underestimated in the fermentation discussion. Well, what I yeah, what I really want is like I'm just trying to like, <laughs> when I go to a mill, I sort of look around and I'm like, how can we take 10 steps away? Like, yeah. what can we stop doing that you're doing that is, you know, not necessarily helping or not helping that much? And so that, that's it's just really funny when when people think that I am creating these like really elaborate, you know, competition coffees or whatever. I'm like, I'm kind of a lazy designer. Like I want to do as little as possible because it's not that rewarded in the market. So I'm like, how do we just make you do as little as possible so that you can do other things, maybe spend more time making connections and relationships and not monitoring 200 hour fermentation. Like let's make that be 24 hours and then do something more important. I mean, I think a lot of being a good consultant is applying something like the 80-20 rule, taking a look at what your client's doing and figuring out what are the simple, what's the low-hanging fruit, what's the simple things we can do to make this better quality, more efficient, more cost-effective, save resources, whatever, whatever the, you know, one of the goals is. But, um, and usually when you, because, you know, because you travel around and you get to see um, many different farms, many different mills, many th- different things people are doing, you have a wonderful perspective. And you can apply that perspective and you can walk up to someone and, and sometimes very simply help them save money immediately or do a better job or, or, or be efficient immediately. And, and I think people don't understand that that's kind of a lot of what a good consultant does. You know, I like to think of it as like, yeah, just a fresh pair of eyes. I'm just yeah. like, I'm going to look at the same things that you've been looking at, but it's really hard. You know, like we get so um, accustomed to what we're looking at that. And even I think just asking like, why are you still doing that? Even like at like my producers asking like why are you still doing that and if the answer is like we've always done it this way yes. or like my grandfather did then I'm like well let's let's look at if that's still <laughs> something that we need to do totally. so just having those questions and sometimes it's tough to feel like I'm because it seems so simple but it, it's really simple to me because I do have that sort of training to mm-hmm. think that I'm I'm helping as much as I want to be helping but I think those questions can be really helpful absolutely. Um, someone here who I believe is a coffee farmer, Finca Soledad. I'm, I'm curious what you would, I'm sure you've heard this before, and I'm curious what you would reply to someone who says this. They say, I would rather work on my own terroir microbiology and not depend on foreign organisms. Oh, absolutely. I, I, that's another huge misconception of my work is that I want, that I, that I require, my, uh, require or encourage all of my clients to use uh, cultured yeast. I don't like, because again, like I'm trying to be as lazy as possible. Like let's take steps away. (laughs) Like if this is something that you don't need, don't do it. Um, And usually it's, it's hard to know in advance if yeast, like yeast is not always better. It will, it will always be the same. And maybe that is better. Like to have an 84 every day of the week versus like, sometimes I get an 86. Sometimes I get an 80. Sometimes I get a 90. Sometimes I get a 78. Um, to me, it can be better to just have that 
consistency uh, as a business, but maybe your business model includes having these like unicorn outliers that you can do something with. Um, but I agree. Uh, if you're blessed with uh, a really great microclimate and you have the you know biological diversity, it may not be better for you to use a culture yeast. Like you, you can really create your own you know mother culture. I just think that the conversation gets it, like that comes down to a moral component. Like that's morally better to do that right. than to add cultured yeast. When the reality for so many people is that they just don't have those conditions. It's like some people are just born five foot tall, and I, you know, I can't be a six foot tall model. Like that's just not in the future for me. Um, and it's not morally better or worse to do one or the other. It's just like looking at your conditions. And some people have a lot more heat. Um, maybe there was something else grown there. There's other factors that would say their local microbes are just not great. And if they, with their local microbes, they get to an 80, but with cultured yeast, they can get to an 86 consistently. Why are we having moral judgments on that? Right, right. <laughs> it's just a, it should just be a business decision. Right. And if, you, and if you're lucky enough to not need that, then you're not morally better than someone else who needs that. You're just really lucky that you don't need them. That's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so we've got about <clears throat> just under four minutes left. Um, I want to leave a little space here. I'd love to know, um, I know you've got a podcast. I know you're on Instagram. I'd love to know how people can reach you, uh, what kind of resources, you know, you, you, you might be putting out there and what you want people to read. And um, if there's just any, any like last parting thoughts you have about fermentation and coffee processing that you think are really important to emphasize, because I, I know that these conversations I know that no matter what you say, people won't always hear what you meant. And so like, I'd love, I'd love to hear if, if you have any sort of messages that you really want to drive home. My biggest message to maybe any producers who are tuning in, which would be super cool, um, or if you're a roaster who would like to share this with a producer, is I think that right now, because fermentation is, is sexy and like interesting, maybe you don't think so, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> because we get to talk about these flavors and molecules changing and it's like, it's super, super fascinating. Um, but it's such a small part of the process. And like I said, we're trying to make it like 24 hours, maybe 30, I mean a 40 or 60 hour fermentation is really long for what coffee can kind of handle. So even seeing things that are a hundred and whatever, but it's still a really small part. Um, the thing that does, that's getting overshadowed and that I think is much more important to quality is drying. So I've seen a lot of producers who spend so much, they buy new tanks, they buy the yeast, they buy their pH meters, they're monitoring their temperatures, they're doing all of this stuff to make like a really solid fermentation. And then they're not paying attention to their drying. And so what we do in the tank for 24 hours is completely overshadowed by the next like 30 days of drying that happen. And so but drying, like watching paint dry, it's like the most boring thing. And so it doesn't get enough attention. So I think for so many people, for so many producers, they could really improve their quality by improving drying and like maybe leaving the fermentation alone, but that's not fun. Right. Um, so that's been a lot of my message now is like, even though I am, you know, focused on yeast and that is my, um, my area of specialty, we're doing <laughs> like, there's so many things that I see in drying that I'm like, it, let's just fix that. So then all of the work that was done in the fermentation doesn't get lost because they are very subtle changes. Um, so I just want there to be more talk about drying just in general for, for quality and longevity. Um, and where people can find me, you know, I ran away from the United States so that I wouldn't be found so much. <laughs> Not a great time. I'm running away to a farm in Colombia for six months so that no one can find me. Okay. Um, but I do have, um, I'm still going to continue to make my podcast and my podcast is uh, a really fun outlet to have these types of, uh, there's actually less conversations. It's more like things I really want to contribute to the industry. So we're talking mm -hmm. about language. I'm talking about some of these wine comparisons of like why carbonic maceration or anaerobic fermentation don't make sense in the context right. of coffee. Um, so if you're interested in any of those topics, like that's what I talk about in the podcast. Um, but the goal of sort of going off the grid and not being um, found just, for the next couple of months. <laughs> just so you know, you've got, you've got about 20 seconds. Just so you Okay. Know. Uh, is to make videos and to make resources sort of later for for people to be able to see. So right now, 
making coffee with Lucy Solis podcast, and then I'll have some stuff on Instagram. But and you've got it. a you've got a Patreon as well, right? I do. Yes. Um, okay. But that's mostly for for like the podcast. If you like okay. that. Okay. Awesome. Well, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> I've learned a lot. I always do when I talk to you. Um, I think you're a lot better at summarizing things than you think you are. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for spending time with us. And for everybody, this is going to be saved on my Instagram so you, you can watch it again or tell your friends to watch it later on. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Take care of yourself. Bye.